Hello and welcome to part 7 of our Eric Olwyn Wright Understanding Class series, where we continue on our way to chapter 2, The Shadow of Exploitation in Weber's Class Analysis. Today is Friday, the 5th of November 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, I have the returning patron, William Smith, and the new patron, Phil, to thank. If you like listening to extra patron-only episodes, creating Discord over on the Discord server, or joining in future reading groups, head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. I really do appreciate all your continued support. It literally makes this show possible and helps me find the time needed for all the reading and research. Okay, enough hard sell. Onwards to the discussion. Oh yes, and the slides are in the show notes. Let's get into it. Weber's concept of class. Okay. Okay. So class is defined within the sphere of economic interaction and involves no necessary subjective identity or collective action. So here he's talking, it's more about your economic interaction or is he talking about your production relation? It's economic interaction. So it's relational like in Marxism, but it is not as directly tied to the cer- and I'm going to use yeah the circuit of production because like service workers even in Marx are even though they don't make commodities they're still working class because they're in the circuit of production and those exploited. So, but economic interactions also for Weber are can be both demand side and supply side. So it, that's different than in Marxism. Marxism doesn't make that distinction. Like the, the distinction between demand and supply isn't a thing in Marx, whereas it is in Weberian notions because you know basically the revisionist liberalization of those categories but it is interesting because like class for baber is not like i can't i can't subjectively just say i identify as working class everyone would just laugh at you yeah like the british understanding of working class as a collective identity is not what baber is talking about here Okay, next next up, status groups are defined within the sphere of communal interaction or what Weber calls the social order. So this is what we just kind of t- discussed. Uh, in Marxist terms, this would be what like we would call this 90% of the, uh, quote, superstructure order or whatever. Yeah. Like, is that how we, how, how like vulgar Marxists would classify this? Okay. I mean, vulgar. Yeah. Yeah, very rude, Marxist. Um, They imply some level of identity in the sense of some recognized positive or negative social estimation of honor. That's an interesting way of talking about the status group. Because that's a little bit different than what we were saying earlier. Uh, I think think this is mostly what we were saying earlier. The the term honor may need some revision in the current context to mean something more like regard because i i think you know honor is not really a uh, a concept that has a whole lot of currency in uh, many social contexts that we live in today uh but, yeah. to all of us certainly not within the emancipation network <laughs> <laughs> Patak, like, like, uh, like, you know, this, like, you sir have insulted my honor kind of idea is, is a little, it, it's peculiar to some cultures, but generally not widely uh, held as the most important thing these days. Well, the way Wright translates this is more helpful on the previous slide, where it's just, um, I don't know, if you think about, like, you know, race, for instance, like, some races are, you know, yeah, is honor is a pretty weird way to put it, but, you know, are more like regarded within the society and others are more kind of looked at with the side eye. And you know, one is to be suspicious of that. This is what this is what right interprets vapor meaning by honor. I kind of wanted to to bring up the, the blue collar thing again, because uh, I've been thinking about Joe the plumber recently. Love him. <laughs> um, Great guy. Great okay. guy. I've yeah, been thinking about Larry the Cable that. Guy recently, so yeah, it's well, kind of the same deal. Well, no, I think I think Joe the Plumber is kind of interesting because uh, he was brought out to be like this representative of like the working class, every man kind of thing. 
And he definitely had that kind of early 20th century kind of uh, cultural aesthetic of, you know, someone who goes to, to work in a factory kind of thing. But the dude owned a plumbing company. He was a contractor. He was petty bourgeois. He was not working class. And so there's like, I keep trying to, to wrap my head around the way that you would sort of think about that in this kind of Weberian sense as it is being applied here, presented here by E.O. Wright, right? Because there, there, there is a kind of a communal sort of status thing going on with certain yeah. signifiers and ways of, ways of acting and presenting oneself and, and certain kinds of regard or honor, whatever the word is going to be used. But there's also, there's also an economic miscategorization happening here that is attached to it. Yeah, and often you have a sort of runaway effect where something, an aesthetic that may have been formed during an economic actor's, you know, assumption of identity and collective action, right? The collective action melts away. The identity remains, becomes a sort of drifting signifier. And for a lot of the workers' movements, the signifier is really wrapped up with nationalist ideology and identity. Like in America, it's especially, I mean, it's, it's like especially reactionary in a way that is more disguised in Western Europe or anywhere that had like, you know, social democracy or something, with the exception of some like settler societies like Israel and Australia, for instance. Is there is there a problem, like, again, getting to what Tiberius is saying there with respect to the title we looked at the last time, that like it's not a distinction like this table you can be in multiple of these zones in the one time and a, a a a status group can actually go against the economic class group that it's not a very it's a it's a way of teasing them out but it's not a it's not sufficient right because they the they seem extremely fungible categories yeah, and you can you can be like for example, like he would be pl- the plumber guy. You could say communally he would be in the working class, <laughs> and you could say economically he's not, and you could say politically he's in another one. Yeah, you know? well, this is this is the fate of a lot of class identities. They get decoupled from collective action, yeah, uh, or even re- re- social relations. Yeah, even objective social <laughs> relations. Yeah, um, I- no, that's fair. I mean, that's like, you know, blue collar, but I own my own business. But I would I would say another thing that's interestingly fungible about all this in ways that problematize it a little bit. We have the collective action problem. We have the cultural identity problem. We have the infinite multi- multiplicity of one of the categories, but not the other two. And we also have the problem, as we said, that like, I don't know that that outside of the realm of law, which I guess is collective action necessarily, sort of, kind of, because we, we all kind of have to agree to it for it to be enforceable, sort Except of. Except when the Supreme Court decides to do something. See, but, you know, like, if we all happen. really disagree with the Supreme Court, we could, I don't know, blow it up. I don't know. I think there's a lot of good <laughs> academic studies out there that have shown that the Supreme Court is essentially tailing society. If you need any same text, lads, just give us a shout anyway. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, we're on some on watch list now, but talking our lot. <laughs> uh, um, in terms of class status group, they may become conscious of sharing common identity, and then they can become a party when they oxidize on the basis of identity. So that's interestingly, that it could be the class for itself or the status group for itself, and also then, like you could have black interest, you know, in alignment or against working class interest, et cetera. So it's nothing here that that doesn't seem true. It just seems so fungible that it's not particularly predicted. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that Weber would follow the line that the status group for itself as a political actor would gradually give way to the class for itself as a more rational form of politics right like this is this is kind of goes with with Weber's line of thinking of where society is going that that you know these values are going to become less and less important and you're just going to get something 
closer to economic rationality being the main political motivator. Right. Except that we have seen, this is where, this is where I think you're right about Weber, but the reason why this gets dropped from Debian analysis is because like it didn't happen that way. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. like um, when I was in, uh, when I was in Japan, I was talking to Japanese former Marxists. Like a lot of what they expressed was like, disappointment in these theories as predictive of where politics was going to go. Like they were kind of like, yeah, we never really got that rationalization that was expected to happen. It, it just, it, it never really happened. And I feel like that's not just true of Japan. That's true of a hell of a lot of the world. <laughs> It's just, it's just a particular sort of view of where history was going. Yeah, whereas the post-material theory of society that predicted that once, you know, you don't have to wor worry about a lot of the basics, a lot of your identity would be about self-expression and, you know, like that sort of thing rather than something that flows from economic rationality. That's a predictive theory that's panned out pretty well. Yeah, but we're seeing the kind of destruction of that kind of class compromise. So we'll see the rise of class politics. It's kind of uh, you can you can also just be immiserated and uh, fanatically devoted to uh, expression of your identity through uh, brands. This is true, but I think this is where the Viberian Marxian sort of notions creep back in. That's not really a sustainable way to live for very long. Yeah, I mean, I guess you got to have your 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 minimum uh, guaranteed minimum income uh, so that you can continue consuming Disney products and be fanatically partisan about them. Yeah, well, all I'm going to say is that Daffy Duck is a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> can can to cancel all the cartoons, all the cartoons. <laughs> Just, just get them, get them out of there. Oh my god! Hey, we already canceled Theodore Geisel, so <laughs> sorry. That was my misogynist. That was my misogyny for the day. Sorry. No, I, 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 I am supposed to yell at you now, Tom. I'll let Derek do it. Tactics. Uh, this is a good one, though. I like it. Okay, let's move it on. Okay, so we've kind of talked about this. Let's see. Uh, let's just have a quick look before we go into a long spiel because we talked the shit out of that table, Daffy Duck. Is Daffy Duck even Disney? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Oh, da no, Donald Duck. No, it's Daffy Donald Duck. Donald yeah. Duck. Is, is yeah. No. yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's why I said it, because I'm a Disney fan, you see. And Daffy is Warner Brothers. Fuck you, Warner Brothers. Oh okay. Okay, let's read this. Yeah, the nature okay, of okay. the mechanism through which caste and status shape inequality is the material and symbolic conditions of people's lives. Class affects material well-being directly through the kinds of economic assets that bring to market exchanges. Static effect it Material well people, being people bring to market exchanges. Yeah. yeah. Indirectly through the way that categories of social honor underwrite various course of mechanisms that go hand in hand with the monopolization of ideal material goods and opportunities. And I would like to say that like this comes up on Marxism too. I mean, like if you look at like with the wages of whiteness from W. E. B. Du Bois, who thought he was a pretty orthodox Marxist, it sounds pretty similar to this. But that's all I gotta say about it. Feedback, I, you know, if you're a vulgar Marxist, this is part of the, you know, superstructure base feedback loop. Yeah, and, none of this matters. Folks. None of this matters, Derek. We don't have to, la, 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 we don't have to, you know, true, true vulgar Marx, vulgar Marxist is a positive, you know. We don't have to listen to this. This is all superstructural nonsense. This yeah, is just the things that people care about that, you know, affect them spiritually. And, you know, there's a whole underlying class form underneath that they're, they're in the cave about. And so, you know, yeah. We'll show we, them the truth. We, the chapel Marxists, will show them the truth, except when we're black-pilled and good all into our identity again. And also, yeah. we're only going to insist on this one part of vulgar Marxism and not, like, I don't know, the the impossibility of national politics being a way of liberation in and of itself or... Right. I'm telling you, and I, you got to some... give you got to give it to them though. You know they they tried so hard, they got so far, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. I got a, 
I got somebody put me on to there was an, a, a Patreon only episode mm-hmm. of Chapo, and they sent me the MP3 on the PMC this week. And I swear to God, it was fucking brain worms. I've never, I, I never struggled. After five minutes, I wanted to hang myself. It was that bad. So I think we're going to, I'm going to play a five minute clip maybe in next week's show, and we can all give out for maybe three hours about it. But this is getting, <laughs> getting towards the whole fucking reason why we're doing this, man, this whole reading group. I, I It made my eyes bleed and my ears. Why do my eyes bleed? I don't know. But it's unfucking believable. Are, are we yeah. starting YouTube beef? The yeah, combination really. made your eyes bleed. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, here's the th- here's the thing about that. I I love I love how vulgar Marxists discover the PMC who, who, whose objective criterion nobody can state. They literally <laughs> had no definition of what it was or any. There was nothing in it. Literally, all it was is I don't like these. I don't like these people. Literally, who, that's it. Uh, t- I don't like who, their aesthetic. T- to whom I am also a member of the vague definition, which I have refused to enunciate. Um, there, there was a book put out recently called Virtue Hoarders. By so Catherine I mean, Liu, which I'm going to That's her. That's who's on it. Okay, right. She so, is fucking unbelievably incoherent. But hoarders, right? Like, again, tapping into this Weberian Absolutely. Like, mechanism. But, in but this, without the coherence of categories. <laughs> Like, right. I don't know. I think a lot of Marxists would be unwilling to deal with this book, thinking about how these things, you know, this is not maybe a class process in the way that Marxists normally talk about it. It's part of an expanded schema, and it's not really related to production in the way that they sort of, In I I have trouble following their arguments, I think because they're incoherent. (laughs) No, they say, intimate. You assume they have arguments. Well, they don't. They, <laughs> in, no one... they intimate that they are, you know, doing a classical Marxist analysis and then latch on to a category that has zip to do with production. And I'm saying that none of these things matter, of course. It's just that that's not the Marxist theory of class. Wright nope. is so good about this. Like, like he's so good about this. Let's talk about these things, but let's also clarify the Marxist theory of class. As opposed to let's not no care about these that. things, but we're going to insist on the Marxist theory of class until we lose an election and we get all butt hurt about it because we never had a fucking class coalition in the first place. So we're going to just pretend that it's all the bad people who are weirdly of the same class we are, but they're not because we don't want to admit it. Yeah, I'll tell you what it on. is. It's the same. Like, this, like the whole thing is a misdirection. Instead of having your uh, you having a dislike and a hatred for the owners and the bourgeoisie, they place their hatred onto the boss who you interact with in in, in your day to day job type, and they they so they kind of they direct away the attack line from you know the people who own the country to the people who are the managers. Is it like it reminds me of like yeah, yeah. they do, we were but watching- they're not even doing that. Like that, that at least had, has a pedigree that you can understand and understand in a, as a mode of production. But like a lot of times when they say PMC, like when like Michael Swayze uses does it, he just means has a college degree. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's so way more incoherent. Like, but it, <laughs> but it allows you like, how does that operate? It's even worse because it allows you to basically, it, it's the, it's the bright kid in your class who was a bit of annoying. And a, and a ner- and a, and, a, and studied hard and put his hand up every time the teacher asked a question. Like it's, that's it's it, Nixon it, 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 as Marx. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, was, I was gonna say it, it's it's like the 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 kulak of our times, you know. I mean, it's yeah. quite literally the people who outcompeted you from a similar position. Yeah, Correct. because all these people are also they're all college. All the people talk about this just are all called. I mean. Catherine Liu's like a UC Irvine media studies professor and poet. I would okay. not like to read her poetry. Give me a fucking break. Oh my god. It was, Don't it trust was... poets. I can no. tell you. I know. Just just look at what happened in Yugoslavia. Don't trust poets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can tell you a story about a, a mustache seminary <laughs> poet from Georgia. That caused some real trouble in the 20th century. Hey, 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 hey. I didn't do that much. 
<laughs> I don't know. I, I think a beard isn't a mustache, even if it includes one. But that's another logical argument. That's paraconsistent. Okay. Uh, logic. No, I was the the only thing I was going to say is that a, a lot of the the PNC argument is kind of um, I'm not racist. You're racist for calling me a racist kind of argument, except for like like weird class non understanding people motivated Re refusal to understand class. Right. But it depends on the people right. who claim to be vulgar Marxists. That's what really bugs me about the whole thing. Like, And when I point out that, like, yes, yeah, some of the conditions that they are talking about do actually exist. It was like, well, you're just, you're just hiding facts you're agreeing with them. I'm like, no, I, it's not a class category. It's actually a conspiracy theory, frankly. It is conspiracy theory of all the nerds that you hated in high school who were probably some group you don't like some status community you don't like, beating up on you now, in parentheses. And that parentheses <laughs> may or may not be Semitic. Uh -huh. I mean, Marxism is now just a communal status group anyway, so let's move on. Let's move it's on. always been. <laughs> Pointing gun at back of astronauts' head. Always has been. <laughs> I think that's yeah. why Wright uses the word, you know, the Marxist tradition. I really do. I think, you know, and there's a, there's a deflation of Marxist identity that I think is helpful because it makes it a little less of a status group. It's not such a virtue word being like, we include you in the Marxist community. Like if you relegate it to like a form of analysis that might be, you know, completely fucking revisionist or reactionary who gives a shit. Like, I, 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 I'm just picturing like a community welcoming committee of Marxists. We include you in the Marxist community. I, I could never, I could never imagine Marxists being that like sunny and, and welcoming about anything. No, but, I mean, you've obviously what... never been courted by PSL. Yeah, yeah they do that well, actually. Yeah, they oh do God. sort of love bomb you at first like that. That's true. But we oh, yeah. normally see it with Marxists in excommunication. This person is not a Marxist, you know. That's the main way that this operates, more if so you, than the positive if you think form. Scotsmen are good at excluding people for arbitrary characteristics. Marxists got nothing on Scotsmen. I used to talk about no true Marxmen all the time. And it, it's funny because in, in, in an objective sense, they're not Marxist. But then it's like, but if I really hold to like to the idea that Orthodox Marxism is the brain worm of, of Marx incarnate as the giant sandworm that rules us all then the only marx was non-existent because not even marx was that consistent yeah. oh. not even marx was that statist you know like and yeah. then the ones that aren't status give up on everything marx said about politics so and also we should just say about the scottish they all just wish they were irish anyway let's let's get that straight <laughs> okay they practice you know it's like you know our red-headed stepchild except we're all red-headed okay I, I think I know a certain general intellect unit member <laughs> who, who might have something to say with that. Or maybe not, actually. He's Irish. They, they're, they're Scottish? They, Question? No. She, 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 she yeah. just, just lives in Ireland. He lives in Scotland. Or sorry, oh, in Scotland. Yes, in Scotland. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Shane, Shane, Shane is Irish, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Europeans all look the same to me. Right, uh, let's keep going. Sources in power. So we're getting on to the next table that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so sources of power in Weber's work. So he says there are three sources of power the individual uses to accomplish their goals. One, social honor. Two, material resources. And three, authority. And they have rationalized and non-rationalized forms. So let's have a look at this absolute banger of a table here. Who wants this to take is the this one. table? Yeah, why don't you take it then, Esri, if you're... I mean, two tables in one day? Jeez. Are you sure nobody else wants this one? I'll take no. it. I'll take it. Do it. Okay. So, class location in Weber's analysis of rationalization. Uh, so, this table has two axes, of course. The x-axis describes the degree of rationalization of social relations. So, the further... Like on the left is the more rational and on the right is the less rational. And then the sources of social power is on the y-axis. And these are the ones that Tom just described. Uh, these are social honor, 
material conditions of life, or authority. Okay, so if you have honor and you are in a non-rationalized social relation, you are in an ascriptive status group, which is a sort of catch-all term for like, you know, feudal stuff. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, you're the duke of such and such, or you're the archbishop of so and so, or you're from this family, or you're you're the mom of you're next in line to inherit the guild ownership title right. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You're the uh, mom of Jan- Janissary uh, sub commander of blah, like just to get out of European examples. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah, from Bra- Vapor's perspective, but yes, absolutely. You're you're right. Yes, uh, it is. This applies universally. Fails uh, on boat dealership nephew. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a rationalized uh, social relation. <laughs> uh, Highly rationalized. <laughs> so, uh, regarding fail sons, uh, <laughs> if you are in a rationalized social relation and your source of power is social honor, you should derive that from meritocratic prestige and not being a fail son of a used boat dealership owner. Uh, <laughs> In, in, in a rational society, you should be in that position of honor on merit. You know, you should have the Order of Canada or whatever the hell you want to say. <laughs> right? Uh, so you're saying okay. the Chet is a rationalized social relation of social honor. The what? To Chet. The, yeah. The, 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 yeah. Like, uh... Sorry. Oh, Podcast oh, crossover. Oh. I, yes. What? Explain. Okay. Explain. Explain to, to, to Father Tom. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> in watch jumpsuit utopia. Yeah, well, this, it, this in, is a in Star Trek in Star Trek Discovery, there's the Orion guy that runs the slave yard, basically, whose aunt like runs the whole Orion cartel. Like, and Sophia nicknamed him to Chet because he just seems like the guy who failed up. <laughs> yes, yeah. he's the he's the fail son slaver boss. So, you know, obviously the Orion Syndicate didn't get the memo from Weber about, one, uh, slavery being inefficient and socially degenerative, and uh, two, about the need for meritocracy in a rationalized society driven by capitalism. I think the way this conflicts with our intuitions is very important. Okay, let's, let's keep it moving here. So, if you're looking at the material conditions of life as a source of social power and you're in a non-rationalized society, you are in ascriptively based consumption groups. Now, that's interesting that it's consumption groups and not production groups. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Makes more sense from a marginalist perspective to talk about consumption groups. And this is talking about, say, you know, the uh, the aristocracy and their consumption of luxury goods. Or it's talking about say, the way in which the social product would be distributed according to some feudal organization of distribution, like where, oh, like you're a peasant on this land, so you're going to produce roughly this much and you're going to get roughly this much just based on custom. But it's interesting because like caste doesn't even work that way. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, even the classic example of, of like of caste systems, they're not based on production groups. They're based on profession, which is, I mean, is, is a production group, not a consumption group, arguably. Yeah. So you would, in terms of consumption groups to look at like a pure example, I guess you would have to say like, you know, I'm a citizen of Canada and therefore I'm entitled to public health care. That is an ascriptively based consumption group. So uh, citizenship consumption groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. and that would be uh, non-rational. But rational is capital and labor. Yes. Uh, so rationalized class. Uh, class. Yeah, you, uh, you basically you get compensated uh, according to uh, your class position in the capitalist system. Okay. That's final rational. one. The source of social power is authority. If you are in a non-rational one, 
authority is uh, assigned according to patrimonial administration. So the, uh, the the fail son, the fail son whose daddy uh, owns the um, used boat dealership. Uh, that would be patrimonial administration. Um, hey, you were scratching and, my back, I scratch your back, Capiche? No? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's like uh, it's like when Sonny becomes uh, the leader of the Corleone family in Godfather because his dad was the, the you know the Don, and Sonny's not actually very good at what he does, but he's the older son, and so uh, he gets this role, and then he gets himself killed. So he must die. Yeah, S- Sonny does die, uh, in fact, because uh, it's an irrational decision. Um, Pretty ignominiously at that. Yep. Crossfire in a highway toll booth. So then we have authority, which is delegated according to rationalized social relations. This is rational legal domination, or in other words, bureaucracy. It's domination done according to rules with a uh, sort of instrumental logic that guides them as opposed to, you know, my daddy killed these people real good. So therefore I, I get to be the one in charge. I, I must say, I really hate the use of the word rationalization all the way through this chapter. It really bugs me. <laughs> you're, you're not going to get on well with Weber. <laughs> True. That is his central concept. But, and I do think it gets to something about, industrial class society. I would extend this to the USSR and its offshoots. What's unique about the USSR is it definitely checks two of those boxes in terms of rationalized. And then the third, you know, for many periods does not actually do capital and labor in the same way. So that's like, you know, one possible objection. Another objection is that the way capitalism actually works has much more patrimonial administration and descriptive status groups than. But rationalized here doesn't admit. mean doesn't actually mean reasonable. It means part of the thing is like the non-rationalized is just more honest about what's going on. That's implied in Weber. Yeah, the rationalized here, like rationalized, means like yes, it is given a veneer of reason, but it also and it is given it is subject to instrumentalized reason, but it is also a rationalized form of the. Prior, like meritocratic prestige is actually not that different from a scripted status, except now we are given an excuse where there wasn't an excuse before, or the excuse was God. No, this um, is a vital point, actually. And I kind of stumbled upon this, but thank you for bringing this out because this is a difference between Marx versus Weber arguments and a Weber that would plug into historical materialism as Engels spins it. Elaborate, please. So if you think that meritocratic prestige and rational legal domination is a genuinely different form, for instance, of social relation instead of just like a new veneer, right? Then you can say there were no modes of production. Things worked completely differently before capitalism. And I know this sounds like a really stupid way to read Weber, but this is this it, it's an elaboration of you know the only mode of production is capitalism everything else is completely different and you can't generalize about them the way that not only just the way that you know Engels or classical Marxists do but you can't generalize about them there's no meaningful generalizations to be made you know with regards to surplus production because what Marxists would call previous modes of production were not centered around production at all like which is very likely not what Weber meant. And the version that, you know, you're pointing to Derek with your, you know, rightful correction where I was taking this because I'm kind of jousting with those other Mm -hmm. Weberians in my brain is that rationalized is more or less talking about the ideological clothing that these forms of class adopt in capitalism. You just you, you have to just make the the caveat that like the superstructure is actually influential on what these forms take, right? It's it's right. it is a rationalization in the pejorative sense or the psychological sense and an ideology, but it also does have a kind of shaping a, 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 of of what of what outcomes are. No, it that's is. that's right. Yeah. That's definitely right. I mean, consider 
what rationalizing ascriptively based consumption groups into class, you know, and Weber's sense of <laughs> capitalism is the only you know, class society in that sense. You, when you go from ascriptive status groups to meritocratic prestige, essentially what happens is that the education system launders your ascriptive status group for you in meritocratic yes. clothing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking like the, uh, the Byzantine bureaucracy where it was nominally meritocratic because you had to go through all of these stages of schooling, but the only people allowed into them are these certain ascriptive status groups. I think the, you know, the, Confucian bureaucracy is the same way. Confucian, yeah, that, that was what I was going to say, yeah. Or as we say in Ireland, Protestants. Yeah, Sorry. What, Sorry. this also okay. brings to mind... I'm getting sectarian um, here. Just thought I'd throw that in. Well, no, this, this, no, this also brings to mind, like, um, the way, you know, Republican government or, you know, bourgeois administration under the Bolsheviks becomes, you know, mustache daddy. And, I don't know, contemporary Russian nationalists will say... And like Putin, you know, we'll we'll say without hesitation, yeah, you know, Stalin and you know the Tsar are, are continuous, more or less. This is kind of what they're pointing to: legal, rational domination through bureaucracy. Which I mean, you can't say it didn't have a meaningful impact in how things went. In the Soviet Union it ends up being very important, but this, you know, in a way, it's continuous with like an old ass reactionary autocratic form of government. Down to the cult of masculinity around it. Cool. Cool. Okay, last, I think, uh, last, <laughs> last slide. Cool. <laughs> what, the, what do you mean by cool? <laughs> it's just a verbal ellipsis. Uh, <laughs> no, I was actually thinking about how, like, this is an interesting element of Weber that is kind of similar to Foucault, where I'm like, so you can take this as a as a critique of the failures of modernity to live up to its own, you know, promises through its, its instrumentalization of reasons to hide essentially irrational commitments, or you could take it as like a way reactionaries do. It's just like, yeah, wasn't it more honest when we just didn't pretend that there was a good reason for this and we just did it? But like, mm -hmm. isn't there like within the you have all this you know the rationalization mm -hmm. of the market and value form and all this stuff going on, but you still have you still have the just the ownership being not a rationalized thing but a something that is passed on from your father or whatever. So like it it has these kind of non meritocratic stuff really fundamentally built into the the system. It's like the case for the rationalization for capitalism is. Like you can see what the what what they're on about, like the the reactionaries, because like it is kind of still there in capitalism, right at the fucking foundation. Yeah. What's well, interesting too when you think about like left bourgeois radicals, and I, I use bourgeois here, important, like in the 18th, 19th century. One of their big things, like if you look at Henry George, which a lot of libertarians love for whatever reason, he wanted to abolish land property ownership, but not not the produce of your later property ownership. And he also wanted to end all inheritance, that the tax on inheritance was 100% and it was redistributed. Now, he was a bourgeois radical, and it seems weird that we've normalized these old patrimonial forms in capital to the point where, like, that seems almost as radical as Marxism. Just be like, nope, no one, get, no one inherits anything. Yeah, right. it's a, the, the, the position against inheritance is generally like, left liberal thing that people uh, go on about but it, it's I, I think it's taken as generally hopeless to to try to abolish inherit uh, abolish inheritance which is funny because it's easy one of the things that mechanistically would be super easy to do yeah <laughs> mechanistically <laughs> that's part of the argument against... thing you've ever said derek it's the most liberal thing <laughs> you've ever goddamn said get off this show get off well, no, this this is a uh, part of what when people defend the USSR as a classless society or something, they'll talk about the inability to, you know, do like property inheritance, you know, without really looking at the, without looking at the bureaucratic aspects of things or, you know, you could, inherit, you, could inherit, you could actually inherit like your father's production thing. Naturally you couldn't, but not formally, but you did informally. Not formally. Right. Exactly. But you did informally, like, Give it long enough, and it would have been formalized. 
you could yeah. inherit you could inherit money, couldn't you? In the yeah, you could. You yeah, you could inherit mm. money, but you couldn't inherit which is funny because there there are other countries in the USSR that no one no one pretends is not capitalist where you actually can't technically inherit land. Some of the Latin American states, like yes, your la your your land goes to your kid, but it's like a foreigner buying land there, it's technically on a hundred year lease. Like it's not actually uh yours mm. legally. But it was also funny because in like Mexico, I remember the teachers unions were radicalized and they were radicalized about a lot of stuff. I agreed with them about but the other thing they were mad about is you couldn't inherit your classroom down to your kid because that was something that had been maintained in parts of Mexico is you, you could literally pass your your classroom and thus your state pension down to your child. That's the way I want us. That's the way we want us. <laughs> We had no dialectics in this session at all. Holy I cannot shit. believe that. That is incredible. How did that it happen? Was, it was only invoked to end a conversation. That was the yep. <laughs> yeah. We okay. used it its, its secondary informal <laughs> definition as a word you say to end a conversation topic. Yeah. <laughs> on that, on that note, on that note <laughs> dialectics. Everybody, one, two, three. <laughs> dialectics. dialectics. On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. Yeah.